Nick, good morning. Alan, how are you? How are you, mate? I'm so happy to see you. How are you? Good to see you. It's been a while, actually. It's been a while. How have you been coping during the last, um, well, the last 18 months, really? We actually have been uh, coping well, healthy, happy. Uh, our customers have been supporting us tremendously, virtually, physically. We luckily never closed down. And the Aces Live was born out of this necessity. Season two. And you guys are the best. Your brother was the first one to jump on the bandwagon. So he didn't know the first season. He didn't mess up too much. He didn't mess up. It shows your, your A, your innovation, your passion, and your friendship. No questions asked, you got on board. Some brands send me a whole questionnaire, guidelines, script. We're unscripted. We no, share we're, our passion. We're totally unscripted. So um... Unscripted, and it's all about fun. So I'm super happy to have you on board because I've been equally working with both you and Giles. Um, I, I, actually, I don't know when our journey started, but we're super proud that we are the exclusive retail partner for Bremont in the Netherlands. We love the brand. We have a small community of collectors in the Netherlands. Uh, guys from all over the world contact us. Ladies even as well. We have ladies wearing Bremont. So I'm super happy to have you here. For those that are not that familiar with Bremont and don't know the English brothers who are British, for those that think it's a joke, um, Giles and Nick founded Bremont Watch Company in the UK 21... Ooh, yeah, 20 years ago. Almost 20 years ago. So it's not that young anymore, but compared to the Swiss behemoths, you're very young. Um, a true pioneers, explorer spirit, real pilots at the helm of a company that also makes pilot watches, but not only. Um, so quick intro. Maybe, Nick, you want to tell us uh, a little intro about yourself. Yeah. We'll jump into a wrist check. And then the seven aces questions. No, of course, of course. So, um, you know, our, our sort of background, you talk about 20 years ago, um, Giles and I, uh, we had a total passion for, as he probably told you, for all things mechanical. I think that's uh, very much where it sort of started. So it was um, spending time with our father, who's an incredible guy, engineer, aeronautical engineer at Cambridge, in a workshop with him. Um, making things so but one of his passions not only airplanes uh, feature fairly heavily in our lives as to uh, cars and things like that but it's uh, one of his passions were clocks so our mother would give us old grandmother grandfather clocks and see if we could restore them with our father um, and they're big, like big Meccano I don't know if you ever in my day there was something called a, sort of a game a, a, mm -hmm. a set which kids could buy it's called Meccano and it was yeah of course yeah yeah we, I buy it for my son now and it's the best, but you can't, it's not easy to find it anymore. But it was all metal with screws. And um, and these clocks were, you know, when they're big enough, they're pretty much like taking a piece of Meccano together and putting it back together. And then we had um, so this joint love of tinkering in the workshop. So, um, and then, our, you know, we're the, when we weren't in the workshop, we're flying. Mm -hmm. So uh, our father was uh, uh, in the Air Force. We were all sponsored through air, the university by the Air Force. And then... Um, we did a lot of air show um, work and, and then um, our, our father did a lot in the 80s, we did a lot in the 90s and then I had this nasty accident with my father in 95 and we, um, yeah, uh, he sadly died and I broke quite a few bones and, and I, I, the, the reason that's important I think is just because it was a bit of a trigger point, a tipping point for Giles and I and um, I rang my brother up from work one day six months later, I'd just been you know, in hospital for many months and I got out and I got back to a desk job um, waiting for, um, uh, for, you know, for sort of life to start again, really. And I sat back at this desk and I thought, what am I doing here? This is not what I want to be doing. And I, and I rang up my brother and I said, look, I'm thinking of quitting. And I was in, uh, for my sins, corporate finance in the city when I was in, a, in my mid-twenties. And I just said, Giles, I don't want to do this. I don't want to, I could almost see my life being mapped out in, um, and I rang Giles up who was doing something very similar but with a different company and uh, and I said to him look I'm quitting and um, half an hour later he rang me back and said I've quit as well I thought oh no my mother's going to kill me because he's only 22 <laughs> proper job there he is 
Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much around that time. And and I left and um, we we got involved with that business actually where that photograph was taken, um, restoring a historic aircraft. And so we still do a lot of flying. It's still very, very big for us. But um, we had this passion to make something, something very tangible. And when you're restoring an old airplane like that Spitfire, um, you know, it's, it's, again, it's a mechanical device. I, you know, theoretically, it should fly as well as the, the day you first, um, uh, you do some good editing here, Alan. I like this, like the bit of, it's very clever. Um, Listen, we uh, share that, that deep passion for the Spitfires. It's stunning. I, I, for our viewers, I'm showing Bremont's, uh, Nick's uh, Instagram account, which is at Bremont Nick. Um, I, I, I utterly love uh, your pictures, Giles' pictures on the official Bremont account, I, the most epic things. And that actually triggered me on Bremont is the professional pilots, the fighter pilots, taking wrist shots in the cockpit know, in the air. Amazing. So we've done those, those things blew my mind. So, well, it's probably, yeah, um, uh, yeah so just quick, so it is, it's probably about a third of our business now, military yeah. around the world. Yeah. So it's quite a big part, but, but that yeah. comes from this love of, you know, flying in the DNA. And then, um, so Giles and I threw caution to the wind. We quit our jobs, as I said, in 2002, we went off to Switzerland and set up a little workshop in Vienna. Mm -hmm. And then since then, it's all about bringing, there's this incredible history, as you know, of watchmaking in the UK. And um, and I think that's that our sort of major point of differentiation is from the, the Swiss and the German companies, really, is that where we're doing stuff here in the UK. So we, um, it's all under one roof, this new facility, which we can talk about in a bit, but it's, um, you can see the bar is still going in, movement parts, um, you know, all our cases, um, you know, we, you can see a lot of, a lot of, I think we made, um, you know, tens of thousands, well, we did make tens of thousands of watch parts here last year, which is really, really exciting in the UK. So, um, so it's 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 a very exciting step in in the right direction in terms of bringing watchmaking back here, and we've taken a very clinical there. That's the new building, um, which I'm so congratulations on that, Nick. That's amazing. Thank you guys, you. you guys made a very bold statement over a decade ago that you want to bring British watchmaking back to where it used to be because a lot of people yeah. don't know that the british were maybe the anchor point in modern watchmaking back then fairing the seas think about gmt um a lot of people don't know that the dutch only have christian huygens and clocks yes. but but the, the the british really made it qualitative and epic and mobile um so you guys always had the ambition to bring it back to the UK, yeah. you, you start with cases, doing spare parts, as you said. Now you guys launched the wing, yeah, and hand that me new thing, which is um, some sort of thirty-five thousand. What we see here, watchmaking space there, but you'll see a lot happening there in the um, in 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 the, under that roof. So um, it's so it's designed so you can literally see that bar of steel all the way to the watches being. Put together which is which is quite exciting yeah so I, I i you guys have invited us many times and i can't wait to come physically visit the factory the manufacturer we also have a manufacturer visit planned with consumers customers but due to covid everything is postponed so i can't wait for that but a little bit later more importantly what are you wearing today let's do a wrist check do you know, this is rather embarrassing. Someone's just <laughs> taken my watch off for me. I can go and get it for, uh, they've just asked me because I've got one of the latest prototypes and they've just taken it to take a photograph. So I'm waiting for it to come back. So I hope- Okay, you know what? We'll give you a cheat card. You can take the clock behind you, which you're teasing with us with because we can't so supply them. A bit of a rubbish one, but I have got, um, I've got something quite fun in the here, which I've, um, been working with where is it uh so um i've just taken off the strap this one here is it's which i love it was a watch a very limited one we did um actually i can't see can you see this one yeah, here yeah 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 oh stunning um 
so this is based on the god it's not a very good uh photograph it's based on yeah. the um, 300 series so it's uh yeah. 40 millimeter case um really lovely size um and it's got the um super me on the back you know the ceramic bezel and it's uh it's just Stunning. a really really good watch but this one was done very interestingly for a um we helped fund a a wreck it, basically it was a very um uh famous incident in um for, for the wrong reasons really mm -hmm. um in the second world war where a um a british uh, naval vessel was sunk mm -hmm. and a lot of the uh, british sailors lost their lives just off the coast of malta and we went down and we worked with the divers and uh, we raised some money by auctioning off a very few a handful of these watches to pay for a, a, a plaque to be put underwater to commemorate these these um, incredible uh, sailors. So this is where this watch came from. And it's, uh, yeah, really, really special. And it's with a diver called Timmy Gambin, who's just done, he's mm -hmm. a bit like the um, Harrison Ford from Raiders uh, of the Lost Ark, but in the, mm -hmm. the sea, he's uh, doing some amazing things. Amazing, amazing. But so I'm wearing a watch that you actually often wear. Yes, the bronze. Broadworth bronze. Um, I love that watch. I always loved it in steel. Here we can see it blown up um, a bit more. Um, three dials. Love the patina on it. Um, do you want to talk a bit about the HMAF watches now, yeah, or should yeah. we postpone that? Because it's actually something very special. And you guys are truly British. You're very modest. But it's actually amazing what you guys have done in collabs. I'm talking about Martin Baker. I'm talking about Jaguar. Boeing, which you've done for many years. Not anymore, but amazing collab. Um, all the pieces that are linked to parts being in there. Talking about the Hawkins that was recently done. Yeah. That was now great. you're doing the Williams. It's it's time after time, you guys, as the Americans say, bring the heat. Well, do you know, it's, so so we have a few. We have three or four partners currently we work with. Most of them we've worked with for a long, long time. So Jaguar, you know, we've worked with for 10 years. Martin Baker, um, probably 15 years. Um the likes of Rolls Royce Aerospace, you know, there's some really lovely, lovely partnerships, but normally there's a, a technical element to it. So it's not just about putting a, a logo on a watch. It's um, yeah. a lot more of that. So Jaguar, for example, it's about, you know, it originally happened from us designing some of the, the cockpit that went into the, um, their supercars. And so mm -hmm. we we're asked to help with that. And then for Rolls Royce, the, the record breaking attempt that's currently going on now, and the Iron Bird watches, is is the watch associated with that but we've built some of the um um the escape technology in the cockpit for for the aircraft itself but here at bremer um and then williams it's about williams formula one it's about a transfer of over of of technology and know-how and we're learning from them and hopefully we'll be learning a lot more from them in terms of operational through po through flow and you know team building and there's some really lovely transfer of skills but the watch you talked about there the um HMAF, it stands for Her Majesty's Armed Forces. So there's a lovely story. If you go back, for any watch collector, and you'll know this, Alan, more than anyone, but um, during the Second World War, the British government went out to a number of different watch brands, and they said, look, we need um, some watches. And this is the design of the watch we need. Um, if you put it back on the screen, I don't know if you've got it there. I know, I'll call it up, yeah. Um, it just, um, I can talk through it. So the British government said to these brands, and they included Amiga, IWC, SEMA, Vertex, you know, a number of... The Dirty uh, Dozen, we call them the Dirty Dozen. Exactly. So there ended up being 12 different brands. And um, we ended up, and it was based on this design. So this design, we've, take, we've done a sort of contemporary version of it. Um, and you can see here, but it had the sub-second at six o'clock. It was all about robustness. It's about being very waterproof. It was... On the back there, you can see the three heraldic symbols. So you've got the, the name. I want, to, I want to interrupt you on this because this is a very important point, I believe, that a lot of people don't comprehend. So you spoke about the Dirty Dozen. You spoke about RAF. RAF is one of the three yeah. armies in HMAF. 
So yeah, very so, important in watchmaking, very important in military watches. The broad arrow is something that's very wanted, very popular. Omega made a interesting link with a James Bond watch, getting the broad arrow back on the dial. But yeah, that's if it. I'm not mistaken, you guys are the first ever watch brand to have a partnership with all three subsidiaries of HMAF. Am I correct? Well, look, this is a really interesting point here. Okay, so this is, um, and you sort of heard it first here. So we, we, we've done a deal effectively with a, the Minister of Defence. Mm -hmm. um, the is, MOD? The, yeah, exactly, the MOD, which is and Her Majesty's Armed Forces. And mm -hmm. um, that includes the Royal Navy, the Army, and obviously the Royal Air Force. And they're all, all three of those heraldic symbols are all very old are on the back of they're all stamped into the case bag but you know we did that rather than putting the broad arrow on the front and the broad arrows is a arrow which the british government came up with during the set it's gone back centuries and what it means i don't know if you know this having the broad arrow it's become a bit of a trendy look i'm uh, working with the army but actually what it means is it's um, it's the whole IP, the intellectual property for mm -hmm. that broad arrow is owned by the British government. Mm -hmm. The reason the arrow was stamped on anything is because it means that it's government property. Yep. So you find it on an old cannon, you know, in on HMS Victory or a, yeah. um, a gun or a, is a military. This is military property. Yeah. So it's illegal. And we went through all this. Um, uh, with the, the Minister of Defence, it's illegal to use that insignia, the broad arrow, um, on a watch. So, so all these watch brands using it, it's at their own peril, really, because it's... Um, they, get a, they, they get away with it because it doesn't have... In the, in the back, often you see WWW and a number. So yes. it, that you need the combination of that arrow it, with the, and that's military issued and property of it which is all military issued materials right i yes, mean yeah, yeah. so it's for all the country so so and that's the reason why you guys did not use broad arrows the symbol on the dials yes correct? exactly okay amazing see so guys we're getting educated here this is the whole purpose of the ace this live to share passion knowledge and have a bit of fun so amazing thank you for that I think we can speak for hours, Nick, but we need to keep it at one hour. I want to run through the seven D this questions. Yes. And then do a deep dive again into what you guys are doing. And maybe I want to reverse the story, go to new and then go back to old. So first cool. question, Nick, what watch or jewel is your favorite and why? So do you know my, my favorite? Every watch we, we make is a little baby. It's a child. It's something which um, becomes you become incredibly passionate about. You know, um, and we continue to evolve in, in, in a way, you know, well, I suppose evolve is the best, best uh, description over time. But for me, it's probably the first ever watch we released with. Um, and I was so immersed in the design, which is the Cream Alt-1C. Mm -hmm. And it's just because it's the first one that we ever did any promotional pictures with. It's the first one. It's a beautiful, um, you know, chronometer. Rating. Which my brother still wears by the day. By it the way, I, I have the black one. He has the cream one. Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. It's, a, it's a really lovely engineered watch. And the whole idea when we started was the fact that any watchmaker that, you know, whether they knew our brand or didn't, would be able to take the back off this watch and go, yeah. That's beautifully made, and and yeah. funny enough, you know, fifteen years on, it still holds its own. It's a still a really beautiful that watch there. Exactly right. Yeah, it's just a really, it's something that means a lot to Giles and I. That one because it's it was the first one. Yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely. I, I once in a while we swap watches, but uh, my brother, my brother and I, and uh, yeah, it's lovely. Amazing. So that one is still the favorite. Yes. Amazing. Thank you for sharing. Pleasure. Second question. Almost rhetorical. What did you want to be when you grew up? No, it's not. Well, it's not. I, I always thought I was going to join the RAF. 
I was until this accident. So, as as I mentioned earlier, I was sponsored through the Air Force um, and flew with them at uh, university, and and then in, that was a long time ago, obviously. But in the early nineties, um, it was we're going through quite a recession in in the UK, and if you wanted to be a pilot, you could join the Air Force, but you'd have to wait three or four years. And I was mm -hmm. so impatient, so I went into the city. So. All of my life, I wanted to be a pilot until this accident, and then I obviously we we went off, and Bremont became our our um, uh, you know our future really. But it's um, that doesn't stop me wishing or not wishing, but wondering what if you know if I had done that route. But uh, yeah, 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 a lot of friends in the Air Force anyway. So yeah, amazing. Um... What did I can't remember? What did Giles say he wanted to be? Honestly, I don't remember. Yeah, exactly. It's probably really boring, wasn't it? No, it was. <laughs> Actually, he's not boring. He's not boring. He <laughs> wasn't boring. But honestly, we are now. Um, I think this is the thirty-first episode already. Wow! And, they, and I'm getting old. I'm already forty-one, past my midlife crisis. No, no, I need no, to. Wait, I need wait. to get my flying permit. Um, I don't remember. And and it's it's been such volatile times that that that, that I'm just going with the flow. I don't remember what you said. Listen, I had my 50th last year over lockdown. And that's when you hit the midlife crisis. That's when you start getting this list together going. I it is. It is. 50 is the new 40. Oh, the 50 is oh the new God. 40. Yeah. So, no, I don't remember. But but for all of those that are watching and listening to the podcast afterwards, want to see, just go to daclist.com and you can rewatch it. People yeah. are still going through all the old episodes and watching them. Um, also rhetorical, but who's your who is or was your role model? Do you know I have two or three in my life, and I, I know it's because I, I think it's um, it's very rare you get you know just one that uh, does everything, I suppose. But you know, as we grew up, without a shadow of a doubt, it was uh, our father, um, yeah. and, and he just had this incredible ability to, you know do a huge amount in a very short period of time. It's very bright. As I said, studied engineering, aeronautical engineer at Cambridge, did a PhD there as well. Incredible with his hands in the workshop. A great father, adventurer. You know, he, you know, he was the one which is, um, you know, has, has had a huge impact on my life. Um, and my mother was very, you know, very um, incredible woman as well. So we're very lucky with our parents. Um, my wife is amazing. Um, she uh, actually, for the last 15 years, she's um, built up the whole Bremont um, mm -hmm. military side of the business. But um, she worked with Giles and I before that as well. So she's, unfortunately, she's poor, poor thing. She's had to experience us for a long time. But um, she, she's been English sandwiched. She is the poor <laughs> thing. Can you imagine? I, um, I want to jump in quickly, if I may. Yeah. Let's just briefly touch upon that military topic. You raised it. A lot of consumers get confused because it's on your website. But just briefly explain to me what your dear wife does with the subdivision, which is called Bremont Military. Because those watches are amazing, but not available for civilians. Yes. No, so so we have a team here. There's actually quite a big team who does, does nothing, but it's called Military and Special Projects. Mm -hmm. So over the years, we've done quite a few hundred of them now. Um, mm -hmm. And as in different military projects, and they may be, you know, British military, US military, special forces, uh, mm -hmm. counterterrorism units, royal protection units. Um, it goes on and on and on. And as I said, there's a few hundred of, um, you know, close to four or five hundred of these different uh, squadrons and military outfits that have been done. And you'll have somebody, and, and some of the projects might be 800 watches, some may be. 50 watches, but they'll come to us and say, look, we're very interested in, um, we love the Bremel brand. There's all the history there with Martin Baker and, you know, mm -hmm. building robust um, chronometers, you know, watches that will last forever. Um, yeah. Can you build one, for example, the F-35 on there? Can you build one based on a model? So they'll normally be based, well, they will be based on a model which already exists, and then they'll be tweaked. Yeah. Um, but it's a complete honor to be working with these incredible people. And 
And it's, you know, they're not available to the civilians, but I, I, I just never think they should be because, you know, if you've been a Royal Marine Commando, as you saw that watch there, or a stealth bomber pilot, that one there, you know, and you're standing at the bar, you don't really want to see someone else walk up to you with the same watch. Um, so we have a very, very stringent um, policy where, you know, you have to have, have shown you, you, you're part of that squadron, you have to be vouched for. It's a bit like becoming a, you know, buying a, a red barreled MB1 watch yeah. which you get if you've ejected. You know, it has to go through Martin Baker. You get an ejectee number when you're fired out of the cockpit and and amazing. You need to get this watch, which is why they're so collectible. Yeah, amazing. Could we say, and I don't mean this in a negative way, a passion yeah. project in the sense that other brands have done it and still brands do it. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's not, it's not, but there's nobody who has such a vast catalog with track record like you guys. Yeah, special division. Could we say because you guys are pilots, because you live, breathe, and, and dream planes and watches, that it's a natural thing that you guys do this? You know, I think you're probably right. I think you're you've hit the nail on the head, Alan. It's not a um. We're not they're not corporate watch deals they are passion projects yeah and and i and i you know you meet some amazing people through it yeah it, um it works brilliantly for everyone um if it's done well it's but it's a huge amount of work it is it is because we have been trying to work with you guys and your dear wife and the dutch squadrons and it's and it's difficult and it, and it's not about commerce is it and uh it is a lot of work there there are many parties involved Um, and the pilots actually buy them, right? No, they do. So, so it's it's not the, the military. You know, it's not the British military buying them for the no, or the or the Metropolitan Police buying them for the Royal Protection Squad. It'll be yeah. them yeah. buying them themselves yeah. because. Yeah. But then, but then they they're seen they're seen as heirlooms. You know, you yeah. if you've worn that F thirty five watch for, and then also the F eighteen watch as you in your flying career, you can hand them out. Their children later on, and it's a part of your history, as we're talking about. Yeah. So it's a lovely thing to pass down. Yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing that you guys do that. Fourth question: If you could teleport tomorrow, where would you go? Do you know? I would go back to. I do you know, my my perfect time. I did, and, and I I feel wrong by saying this, but I, the twenties and thirties for me, I you know I just think that was. I mean, it's very difficult because you're coming out of the most, you know, horrendous First World War, ignoring the, you know, the, that part of it. Um, the 20s and 30s were so special. I think it's a period of real adventure. Um, I, I love the fact we there's so such a lack of health and safety. I think we've just as a as a, you know, I think we've just become so obsessed as um, not just in the UK, but every country in terms of. We can't do anything if there's any risk attached. And the problem with that is, you know, what is the point of living? And I and I agree, it's not about being reckless and silly, but at the same no, time... No. Pushing the boundaries. It is about pushing the boundaries and having a bit of an adventure. And, and I just feel those two decades were just amazing. I mean, I would have, you know, in a, in a perfect world, yeah, I'd love to have been around then because it was just... That pioneering aviation time, you know, the Bentley boys were the driving. You had these, yeah, incredible cars, planes, and just this amazing feeling of we've had this awful five years, um, you know, the First World War, and this this feeling of release and hopefully mm -hmm. what everyone's going to feel a little bit like coming out of lockdown now. It's this, you know, I want to have fun, and so uh, I want to take that parallel, if I may. You were talking about the original Roaring Twenties. Literally one century later, we're in the 20s again. We are. Nothing roaring about it yet. Yeah, but there will be. There will be. There will be. And you guys are pushing the boundaries. You guys are explorers. You are adventurers, both the English brothers and everybody around you. You're doing it subtly. You're doing it organically and in evolution. It's not revolutionary in the sense that it's out of the blue. It's two decades going. Hopefully another more decades, and we'll see the next generation English siblings coming into the company. But 
what do you expect for the coming decade and especially for Bremon? And um, will this why will this be the new Roaring Twenties if you, if if we take it a bit broader? Well, you know, I think um I think it's it's hard. I think the I think first of all, I think people having experienced the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. Um I don't know about you, but I, a lot of people I know are saying actually when when you know the smoke clears and the mist lifts I want to have a bit of fun because mm -hmm. time is incredibly short. We're yeah. not this planet for a long time and uh while some people may have been happy um uh, just being completely locked down over that period most of us aren't most of us want to socialize most of us want to do anything, you know fun thing so i think that's really important hopefully there'll be a bit of, a bit of you know ha having fun not revenge spending as for such but you know going off and saying actually i've not be able to do anything for the last 18 months let's go and buy this lovely watch that i you know haven't been able to do or can i go on this lovely holiday and the fact we're all trapped is hard um for bremont the next you know this this period is um as we mentioned it's it's been a period of huge investment i mean this whole facility here is you know tens of millions of pounds in terms of investment that's gone into it um and we just have this utter drive to be able to look back you know in 2040 and say Actually, Bremer played a, you know, played a, a role, hopefully a significant role, in the reinvigoration of watchmaking in this country. And and you know, we've got a lot to learn. You know, there's um, whilst we led the world in watchmaking 120 years ago, um, you know, we've lost it over two world wars and over the last 100 years or 50 years, really. Um, and it's actually more like 100 years. And now it's about learning from the best in class and, and and doing it properly and hopefully people can see that's what we're trying to do here at Bremont. amazing that I, I definitely do i know you guys rather well i know for sure you guys are not about the bottom line the roi you guys are a family business you would outsource everything if that was the case and you know exactly there's a lot of out there that exactly. are just not doing you know they're outsourcing everything other than there's five exactly. people in the office the rest is just done and yeah. we're the complete opposite i and i concur and it's not just you guys because you're a big brand today I've, i've had the honor to work with a lot of people on your teams several teams everybody's lovely everybody thinks the way and acts the same um alan i'm pleased you noticed that because it's um No, it's it is true. You just want to work with nice people, don't you? It, it's so well. Important. That's besides that we love your products. That's not everything. It's all, it's about the 360, and that's what I love about you guys. And my question to you is: in that context, where does this deep, deep instilled drive comes from to create this legacy for both of you and and and, and everybody around you? Um, where does the drive come from? I, I, I think uh, I think it's in our DNA. I mm -hmm. think it's something which you know. You, I think it's uh, partly you know genetics. I think we're just Charles and I wired the same way, and we just mm -hmm. we're not content with you know. Again, when we started Bremont 20 years ago, we weren't content on taking three generations to build up the brand. We really wanted to build it up in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. because i don't know what my children want to do you know my son wants to be a zoologist you know he's 15 mm -hmm. he's obsessed with animals i'm not going to yeah. force it down the watchmaking route necessarily yeah. my daughter might be different um you know so so i think that's part of it but also i think um you know we're we're really fortunate you and i we're in an incredible industry there's some really wonderful people you're meeting people who by default um not only enjoy mechanics and enjoy what goes into a watch but um you know if you're buying a a watch like a lot of the brands you stock you tend to be um doing interesting things in the rest of your life to have got to that stage when you're positioned to buy these things so you are meeting some incredible people the whole time whether it's military whether it's um you know other engineers whether we're just we're just uh, and retailers you know you, you and you've got so many great stories and you know we're not selling double glazing not that mm. there's anything double glazing there there's some yeah. great, yeah, you've got some wonderful <laughs> double glazing there there you are um, <laughs> but, uh, 
but the point the point is it's um it is a lovely industry and we're very yeah. very fortunate to be in there and, and it's nice that you mentioned that because what i wanted to say and i forgot what i love about the 360 of Bremont and that I couldn't have anticipated who would buy when we started off working together is it's lovely that it really attracts pilots. We get so many either Anglophiles, people who love British yes. stuff or culture. Is or there still, is there still, is, Alan, is there still any of that after Brexit? Uh, hopefully there is. It is, it is, it is, it is. It is. It is. On our people. side, there's no animosity. Well, we nothing love changed. Guys, so it's just a, it's a, there is no, there is no animals. Nothing changed here, and actually, we attract loads of pilots. Whereas we almost sold any brand that makes pilot watches because we love pilot watches. My dad always dreamt of being a fighter pilot as well. He didn't make it. He became a regular soldier, I think, due to his eyes. But he he instilled that passion in us, and. What we never had is helicopter pilots. And I don't know why, but helicopter pilots love Bremont. And we get them from all over the world, not just the Dutch pilots. So that's amazing. So as they say, your vibe attract, attracts your tribe, that's you guys. So it is not a marketing mumbo jumbo story. It's holistically what you are and you radiate it and you attract it. So that's very nice. But first question. I assume you read a lot of books to see a few I, behind I you. I do. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, actually, you know, there's, a, there's a few. There tends to be... Um, do you know, I'm rereading one of my favorite books of all time. and it's Which called, one? It's called The Lonely Sea in the Sky. And it's by... I don't Sir know. Fran it's about a chap, incredible guy, called um, Sir Francis Chichester. And I honestly, I've given it... I've bought so many copies over the years and I've given them out to friends because it's, yeah. it is a book which will change your life. I, he, he, it's an incredible guy. So it's, it's a plucky young 20-something-year-old who um, in 1928, I think it was, or uh, 1930, that sort of a time, he, he learned to fly and uh, it is by Sir Francis Chichester. Yeah, this book there. And... Off he went and he flew in a gypsy moth, which is a 1920s airplane from England to Australia. Um, and he wasn't a particularly good pilot. Um, and he had a few accidents on the way. But it was incredible. He's just the most amazing navigator. And he would take off from, you know, Norfolk Island, off New Zealand, and head to Australia, and, you know, and land in the open sea on his float planes, take a dram of his whiskey, and then carry on. So it's a, it's a, it's a real story about adventure. But also, he became the first guy to um, stay around the world as well, um, solo, um, in the 60s. So uh, uh, that's Giles and I a long time ago. Um, <laughs> you, you guys are literally trains, planes, and automobiles, huh? We are. And both. It's, it's terrible. It's terrible. Um, but um, it, it's a lovely, lovely book. And you know we're going back to the 20s and 30s we are talking about earlier about this incredible, you know, it's just, sorry, that's my brother, that's very rude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm just proving to our viewers that you guys are really, really what you say you are and you first so, do that, and then talk. You don't come up with marketing stories and then try to fill the story. So this was your trip in the US, I think two years ago? Yeah, no, so we, we drove, Giles has had that car um since nine well he's had it for 25 years that old 911 and mm -hmm. and i've got an old uh e-type um mm -hmm. which our father restored for our mother and we said actually why don't we go across america we've got some really lovely retailers in the states and we said why don't we do a trip from east to, to west coast and um yeah that's a garage at home and um and it was just uh you know, really, really lovely um, trip and going through Death Valley, Yosemite and um, Joshua Tree and the Appalachians and all these sort of places. And you realize that in this day and age, you still can have a bit of adventure and just jump in an old car and do these things. It's great fun. Really, really good fun. Amazing. OK, so sorry for that intermezzo. Um, next question, because 
we, we, we were chatting and chatting and we can go on for hours, but I see we did already two thirds of the show um, and we have a lot of ground to cover. What do you think is going to be the color of 2022? We know what is 21. We've seen the explosion of colors. Well, green, green, lot, green. There's a lot of green, isn't there? We've been doing yeah. green for a while, actually. We've done a yeah. good store on the um, back in 2007. One of the, oh, you saw that cream colored watch. We had mm -hmm. a green version of that as well. Um, and there's a, there's a lovely green, which is called British Racing Green, which you'll mm -hmm. see on a lot of these old cars and things. And we did some watches of that. Um, with the the Jaguar watch there, which we talk about there, that's got, you know, that's a, a lovely grey, but also the racing green version there as well. Um, this one, this one is to honour us. This is quite to exactly, honour the Dutchies. This, this is Dutch colours through and through. Yes, um, and this is part of the military collection again. The um, uh, so Argonaut. The Argonaut. So this I is love that one, one. Um, which we love. Um, so. Do you know, I think you'll see some more pastel colors coming out, actually. Um, okay. I think there's been some quite cool sort of dips in the water, toes being dipped in the water with some quite fun pastel-y things. If it's done in the, in the right way, and it's all about the subtleties of that color, isn't it? Because they can be quite sort of putrid or they can be really beautiful. So, um, I, but I think color is great. And I think it's really nice. People... I've got to own the black dial and the white dial watches, mm -hmm. but a bit of color like that blue you saw there. Mm -hmm. um, with uh, we've used blue quite a lot, and I love a blue dial because if you go for a, a dark blue like that, it looks so different in different lights. Sometimes it can almost look black, um, and other times it can really have the color. So that's a lovely photograph there. Um, and I think it's great. And, and any watch that makes you smile. But also the important thing, I think, Alan, is being able to pick that watch up in 20 years' time and saying, actually, mm -hmm. I'd still like to wear that. That, I think, has always got to be a question you ask yourself. That's an interesting topic you raised. So when you guys design, and Giles and you actually design also? Yeah, we do all the watches, yeah. Do you... Well, actually, it's a rhetorical question. It, it seems everything you guys do... You have legacy in your mind, and you're doing it for the future, for 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 heritage. Is that the case? Would you ever make something that's fashionable, or is that a no go at Bremont? Um, listen, I think um, you know, there's I, I'm I, I'm I'm all for using interesting materials. Mm -hmm. Whether it's you know uh, interesting steels, we've used you know four six five custom steels. We've used lots of different titanium. You know, you've done. We we do we're milling some titanium in the room over there at the moment, mm -hmm. and um, there's some really exciting things happening. So I love innovation. Mm -hmm. I'm not a massive one for fashion because I think when you're spending a chunk of money on a watch, um, you don't want to look at it necessarily and say, "Oh, that's so 2020." Mm -hmm. um, you want to be able to, I think, look at that watch in 20 years' time and go, actually, I still like it. That's, I think, is the test of time. And I think all of the lovely um, vintage watches that people go for are ones that you could wear on your wrist today and, and not look silly. Um, yeah. Having said that, there are some really cool, quirky designs from the past, but which have become, well, probably fashion-y at the time. Um uh, like, um, I mean, there's quite a few on there. What's what's the um, what's the watch Elvis Presley used to wear with that very cool sort of triangular the Hamilton? The Hamilton, you know, yeah. so that was a really cool, it's yeah. a bit like the um, you know, some guitar shapes. I think it was yeah. just a very clever design. And whilst that would have gone out of fashion, it's sort of come back in a bit now. And um, uh, that's another, <laughs> yeah, bad. But, you know, guitars are the same, aren't they? Um, that's with Ronnie. We did a great um, project with Ronnie over the years, which were... Um, which was know, amazing. I love the art dials. They, aren't they brilliant? And They're brilliant? Um, it has nothing to do with fashion. No, that's art. So that's... Exactly. Uh, that's different. But listen, Alan, it's a very fine line. It's a very, very fine line. And, you know, he's... Uh, you know, it, it's. I don't think there's any right or wrong. It's just personal preference, isn't it? I agree. And I, and I think, I and I, and I, and I much prefer to see someone 
pushing the boat out, a brand going on doing something interesting rather than just regurgitating the past as well. Yeah. I, I, and, and, it, and he's a friend of the brand and your friend and, and you guys love guitar. So it's a natural collab. So it's not about fashion. I love no, we, that. Exactly. We did, we did um, a clock with him back in yeah. oh, years ago. And, I remember. Uh, and he hand painted this amazing clock and Giles and I had to go to Monaco with him and look after him for two or three days, which was an experience in itself. Um, but he is the most lovely, lovely guy. I spoke to him this week and he is the nicest, nicest guy you'll ever meet. He's just, um, incredibly talented and an artist in the true sense of the word as well yeah last question again rhetorical because we actually hosted an amazing event together in amsterdam where you flew in for the dutch premiere of the kingsman movie where not only bramond played a very important role in the whole movie but you did as well I absolutely love Amsterdam. I think it's one of the most prettiest towns or cities in, in, in the world. I just love the waterways. I love um, the architecture. Um, I just think it is, it is very, very, very special. I love the Dutch. I love the, they're almost, I love the way you're on bicycles the whole time. I love, yeah. all, but you're ahead of your time in many ways. And I think that's, you know, the whole of the rest of these cities around the world are trying to get you know use a bit of leg power and get on bicycles and you've been done it doing it for for, for decades and I, and I absolutely love that um i won't tell you about my geography field trip i did for two weeks when i was um uh in my early 20s that's so there's probably a load of amsterdam experiences you don't want to hear but it is um <laughs> but we did you know the heineken factory actually was a great one the The, the Van Gogh Museum is, is amazing. Um, uh, Anna Frank's house, you know, there's some, there are some incredible things to see, but actually going there and just absorbing, you don't even have to go into museums. Just walking around the streets in itself is, is very, very special. Um, but Holland as a, t as, a, as a country, the Netherlands, you know, as a family, we used to sail over from, from England to the IJsselmeer and, and uh and sail around there and go to um, rotterdam and all these different places and i think it's just a brilliant country really fantastic country amazing thank you so much um we have a lot of questions pouring in a lot of viewers couldn't join live sent in questions but before we jump to them let's spend a few more minutes on novelties or yes. wing or talk to me what did you guys do In the first trimester of 2021, you you launched new models. We've seen a few. I just shown them. New collabs, new Jaguars. Well, what do you want to highlight, Nick? Because we're yeah. running out of time. I think it was a it was a weird year for everyone. I think yeah. we, um, we kept releasing the watches we said would release because we didn't want to let people down. But at the same time, we did it in a very sort of low key way. Um, yep. We pulled out of Basel World as it was back then, probably five or six years ago, um, because we just didn't like the direction it was going, and we started doing our own townhouses. But now we've got this our own, this this proper home here, and in Henley, um, we we decided to launch the products from here. We had three or four main products released this this year. One of my favourites is the S three hundred two, which mm -hmm. is the forty mil. Um, uh, diving uh, GMT and I just think it's the detail in it, the size, the everything. It's this sort of size watch. It's the most beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's a watch I'm really proud of. Um, that's it on the bracelet and you've got it on there. We did this lovely kind of um, almost deserty colored, colored strap, which I, it looks fantastic. It matches the loom, but it can come on both. And it's been, it had some lovely reviews on it. It is quite timeless. It, again, it's one of these watches you pick up again in a few years' time and still feel good. Um, I love the GMT. Um, so we had the GMT on the inside bezel, but keeping the rotating diving bezel on the outside, um, which is a conscious decision. Um, 
It's got this lovely old loom, which we originally used on our P51, and we've kept using it. So that's a watch I'm very happy with. The, the, yeah, we did lovely. a lovely um, collaboration with um, uh, Jaguar. We've worked with mm -hmm. Jaguar cars for over 10 years now, but um, having a uh, Jaguar cars, and, and especially the old uh, vintage uh, E-types and things, you know, the fact it's their 60th anniversary of the E-Type this year mm -hmm. is quite special. So we did something really special with them, which was this. It, you know, I think, I, you know, life is becoming about more about experiences as well. So we did this lovely watch last year where you bought this watch, this box set, and you got to fly in the Spitfire for the Battle of Britain. This was something mm -hmm. similar. If you're into driving, this thing is the same. So you've got this incredible car, which we had to commemorate with this beautiful choice of either gray um, or green racing green watches but it came with a rally timer and this rally timer is something you can put in your car i think there might be a picture of it at the end but it's it's combined with so the, the, they're basically doing this continuation um e-type so that's those are the two watches and there's the rally timer at the end that's um, lovely. it is it's very very cool but you also get the chance to drive three very famous e-types around the Fen Fenend uh, test track for Jaguar. Yeah. So mm -hmm. it's just a lovely, lovely thing to do. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, we're only doing very limited numbers of each color. So that was quite fun. Um, then we've got the Supreme Chrono, which I mm -hmm. love. Um, it's the first sort of proper di diving chronograph. It's a 200 mm -hmm. meter diving chronograph we've come up with. But the challenge was keeping it as thin as we could. Mm -hmm. um, it, uh, it uses a Lejeu, um a chronograph movement, but it's just it's just a really lovely watch, actually. And in the flesh, when you see it, um, it's got the ceramic bezel. It's got a big, big open case back, which for diving watches, you know, is a nice thing to have. Um, it's uh, it's a 42 stroke, 43 mil size, so we try to keep it, but but the thickness is, is sensible. Um, and in the flesh, it looks brilliant. And there's two colors, so there's the black and the this kind of almost slaty blue color, um, dark blue, which is really, 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 really pretty. So, yeah, it's so it's uh, last one here for our viewers. But yeah, yeah. Um, we have a tradition with you guys to do a drunk show, events. We did a fish and chips evening, a beer evening. So as soon as it's allowed, we'll uh, try to set up something. We'll be back. And obviously, we, we'll do it in Amsterdam. Um, we'll try to come over to you guys. Um, we have, we have Nick, seven minutes left. Let's just jump but in. Alan, on that point, just quickly, if you have any of your clients who are genuinely interested in coming over and seeing what we're doing here, everything from um, mm -hmm. the movement part manufacturer and the case manufacturer and the watch assembly, the watch manufacturer, I'd be delighted, absolutely delighted to show you all around. So just, just let you. your viewers know. And we'll take you up on that offer. And I know you mean it. So we'll definitely see you out there. Let's jump into the questions. On YouTube, Ernie Romer's writes, Hi, Nick. After so many years, it's so nice to see you and hear you talking again. Oh. I still cherish the visit to Henley on Thames and our Basel World meetings a lot. And so does my wife, Jacqueline. He continues... I know, of course, about the history of the brand, but here are two questions for today's show. What has become of the old farmer, Mr. Antoine Bremont? And have you ever considered to launch a special Mr. Antoine Bremont watch? Warm as regards to Giles or Ernie Romas. So Ernie is obviously a bit of a legend in the industry, and it's so yeah. lovely to hear from him. And uh, I, miss, I haven't seen Ernie for ages. Um, um, but uh, at the first Basel Worlds, everything else, I remember bumping into him. So, um, yeah, the story with Antoine, obviously our surname's English. So uh, two years after my accident, we ended up, um, we're flying down through France again. And we had a precautionary landing in a 1930s airplane we're flying. And we landed it in this pea field in France. And, and if you do the, the same in America or England, you know, you apologize to the farmer and everything's OK. And, and France is very bureaucratic. So long story short, this incredible guy came out to help us. And we put the airplane in the barn. Um, and also our father was no longer with us. Our surname was English. We didn't want to name our watch brand English because I, I don't think we could have either for trademark reasons. 
So in in the end, we decided to call it um, Bremont after this amazing man who helped us. And he's 78 years old when we met him 20 years ago. So sadly, he's no longer with us. Um, but uh, his memories live strong. And, you know, he was an incredible guy who had our father live for another 20, 30 years. He was so similar to this guy, you know, had a had a workshop. In fact, it was a very similar airplane to that one we um, had the landing in. Um, we ran out of fuel, basically. It was, the weather was so bad. And this is pre-GPS. Um, so it's a map, a watch and a compass. And that was, uh, didn't, we couldn't find the airfield. But um, those are the sort of things we'd get up to those days. Um, but no, I mean, never say never with um, a limited edition watch. It would be a lovely thing to commemorate. Um, but sadly, you yeah, know, he saw the original prototypes of the watch, but we never actually, um, he, he never saw the brand release, you know, come to, you know, released officially. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shame in a way, a very, very shame. But it was yes, yes. It had is. a great life. Indeed. Thank you, Ernie, for watching and thank you for your feedback. Yeah, thank you, Ernie. On YouTube, Dave comments, this interview gives me the connection that I personally have missed with Ramon. Hearing about the brand history, the people behind the brand, company, etc. And then he, oh, this is my friend, David. Hi, David. Thank you for watching. He continues. What could Bremen do to connect with the Dutch brackets or any non-British watch buyers not being a pilot? Interesting question, David. Thank so, you. It, it's a hard one because... Um... Uh, obviously, we're here in this country, and I think if you know about watches, you'll ne definitely know about Bremer in the UK. You know, we're in 100 and something points of sale, and we're, you know, have our own boutiques and things. And it, it is hard, and we'd love to have more presence in. We're lucky to have the likes of yourself out in, um, in, in, in Holland. Um, I, you know, I, it's almost, there's a couple things here. One is, you know, as, as a watch brand, it's quite complex. You have to be a, an engineering company, a manufacturing company, a, a retailer, but also a marketeer. And I think it's when you get to the, you know, the big, big brand size, that's when you can really start pushing the big and brand ambassadors, which have global appeal, not just a country appeal. And that's what we're sort of looking into more because you, can't, you can have the best brand in the world, but unless you're marketing it, um, you know, why would someone, you know, other than a very uh, keen watch guy know about us in, in the Netherlands? It's, it's difficult. It really is hard. But no, I'd love to. So if you come up with any great ideas, we're, we're all ears, as, we, as you know. Definitely. Thank you, David, for watching. Yeah, so you, we're slowly running out of time. Um, we have our dedicated guest, Rocky Wrights, on YouTube. Love the Green E-Type 60 Limited Edition. He runs the Watch 4 crew. Another war, Watch 4 crew member is Melvin. The Ventura. He on the Elvis watch is the Ventura, of course. Um, we actually had an interesting one but sent in to us. But I think we should... Um, well, actually, the 911 is your brother. So no, no, I think no, that's no. a rhetorical question. It's obviously the Spitfire. Yeah, no, I, I think... Um... That feel, they're all both, they're all amazing. But I think um, that feeling when you take off and you strap a Spitfire to you, it's uh, something which is quite hard to um, to to recreate. I think anyway. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I I really enjoyed this. We really need to cut it short, Nick. I really really enjoyed this. I really hope you would come back. Our next episode is the twenty seventh with Giorgio Re of Recalo Jewelry. I want to thank you so much, Nick, for sitting down with me. Well, I want to thank all the viewers and hope to see you in person very soon. Well, invites here. Thank you so much. It's fab seeing you again. And thank you, anyone. Um, and, uh, yeah, please feel free to come visit anytime. Thank you. See you soon, my friend. See you soon. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Bye.